Welcome to Facebook Live. I'm Dr. Annette Mercatop. And I'm Justin Westmiller, Director of Homeland Security. We're going to start out with a brief review of the data and then get right to your questions. So our COVID status report for today shows uh, total cases now over 1,000 uh, with the vast majority of people recovered. We have um, added a few deaths and our percent positive is now at 2.6 percent with a slight increase of new cases per day uh, close to nine. So we are seeing a slight uptick in cases per day in our percent positivity. I want to say that that percent positivity is a very important uh, number that we keep our eyes on because it helps us predict whether we're going to see a real surge in cases or we're just going to continue to see this little upward climb. And at 2.6 percent we expect just a little bit of an upward climb, something we can keep up with. So it's important that everyone continues to go get tested. The more testing, the more accurate that percent positivity number is, and, and we can rely on it more. So keep going out there and getting your tests if you feel ill or if you feel like you've had an exposure. Uh, next is our graph, and I'm going to just say yes, we're increasing. Uh, we need to take that sl steep slope at the end there with a certain grain of salt few more days we'll see if that steadies out and uh, gets to a new plateau or um, hopefully comes down. So it's a little early to say uh oh but we're watching this very closely. And finally as I mentioned our testing positive, uh, our testing capacity remains good, uh, adequate, it's always better to have more and we're going to continue to work on getting yep. more testing capacity but again our percent positivity slightly increased but still well below that five percent mark uh, that we worry so much about. If we start getting over three percent as well we'll start um, making sure that we, we watch things. Now I did want to share a little bit of some national information because I noticed that was going around a little bit on social media and uh, we still have a lot of cases or a lot of states in the United States that are having a, um, a lot of cases. But the Midwest is kind of becoming the new hotspot. It's becoming the new Southwest or the new South. Um, there are several states that are showing very concerning trends. That would be Wisconsin, North Dakota, and South Dakota. Um, all of these states are reporting record high daily uh, cases, daily incidents. And Wisconsin seems to be the trouble spot. It's reporting uh, more than 2,200 new cases per day. So if you're traveling, be really careful if you're going to those places. Also, uh, the Wisconsin percent positivity, as I was talking about, went from 7.6%. So right there, they had trouble, and it's up to 17%. So they're having trouble in Wisconsin. Avoid Wisconsin if you can. Uh, there is also some increased hospitalizations being identified, particularly in North Dakota. So those are always worrisome uh, signs. Um, the good news, Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio are the only Midwest states currently reporting relatively steady or declining daily incidences, although Michigan is showing some slight daily increases at this time. So Michigan is watching things closely as well. The biggest increase in cases continues, or recently, is the um, individuals under 30 years of age. So what's driving a lot of this resurgence is our young people. The presumption is a lot of college kids going back to colleges, letting down their guard. And that is, in fact, what we're seeing here as well. Um, siblings that are off to college, they come home, the rest of their family gets infected, and it goes from there. So uh, where did I leave off on the graph? Uh, the only one you left out was the closing. Okay, yeah. so last but not least, our dashboard. Uh, please refer to our dashboard. Another great place to go is the My Safe Start dashboard, where they report each county's um, incidents. They're about a week behind, would you say? Yeah. So, yeah. but it still gives us a good. It gives you a good idea. We we base a lot of our recommendations, for instance, to the schools to our businesses and our community partners based on what's happening in the community around them. And so the higher those rates go on those dashboards, the more we advise stricter and more cautious um, interventions. So and not to say we, we, you know, everything all, everything goes loose when we're down, we still have to be careful, but as this goes up, we have to be even more careful. So that's where I'll end, and we'll get right to your questions. All right, we have a question, and that one is, where in the county is the rise in cases? All over the county. Yeah. 
Uh, there isn't one section. In fact, one of the things we do with our data is we continually reevaluate it and look how many cases per million. It standardizes it, even if you have a low uh, community a lot of people in it and you can kind of see if there's a little bit more in one place than the other we're not seeing hot spots in our county we haven't all along this seems to be scattered throughout you're going to see more cases in more heavily populated areas but when you put it in perspective of how many people there are there isn't more COVID in one location than the other what we are definitely seeing are little pockets so we'll see a little pocket as you know we'll see pockets in Port Huron or we'll see a pocket in Algonac we work that up and then something springs up in another area completely unrelated. So, so far, um, I would not avoid any one place, but I would, I would be careful no matter where you go. There isn't a place, probably outside of your own home, that you really uh, should be letting your guard down. All right, another question. Are mm -hmm. you seeing long-term effects in those who have recovered from COVID? Are we seeing long-term effects from those who recovered from COVID? And I can't speak to that. There has not been any consistent case review of the COVID cases, certainly not that I have seen. There are reports, more and more reports, of individuals who have prolonged symptoms after a COVID recovery. Um, I believe those reports, they're real, but how, um, how common that is and the impact on our community locally, I, I really can't tell you. We'll know more about that um, as the months go by. There'll be more research and studies on that. Yeah, and, and they're constantly researching that too. So we're learning every day new interventions, new drugs that are helping, new uh, techniques to, mm -hmm. to provide social distance and things like that. So we're learning everything all right, the time. So there's a situation called post-viral syndromes. Um, they're rare, but we know many, many viruses, including influenza, where people can get complications. Um, and uh, myocarditis, inflammations of the brain, things like that that happen after viral infections. So that definitely occurs with COVID as well. Whether it occurs more with COVID than other viruses, we really can't say. Um, but we do know it is occurring and um, we're gonna have to just kind of keep our eye on it. COVID is a very interesting, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is unique. It is very interesting, it, it affects um, different um, types of immune complexes in our bodies. It seems to cause, uh, I mentioned this before, a, a vasculitis type picture, which is where the blood clots and things are coming from. So it is different, and we're gonna need to spend a lot more time learning about it as time goes by. All right, are other, con are other counties contact tracing, like near Detroit? My aunt, my aunt and uncle were in the hospital with COVID, and my uncle died, and I was told that no one was in contact with them and those that had been exposed. Hmm. Well, I can't, can't speak specifically to how other counties do it, but I do know we're all supposed to be doing the same thing. I would imagine in a county with millions of people, it's a little harder to keep up. I'm very proud of our staff and how with contact tracing. I feel that they're right. On, like within 24 hours, we usually have everyone notified. That's probably not possible in a community of millions right. of people. Uh, but I also know that the state has developed a standard like if you will, a report card that goes out to all of us on a weekly basis that measures how many cases we've identified within 24 hours, um, the uh, percent of completion of our contact tracing. And so communities that maybe aren't doing as well, they're gonna know about it and they're gonna be um, supported and encouraged and given the support they need to do better. Um, the state has been doing that now for a couple of months. All right. Have there been any positive cases in the school districts other than a couple of weeks ago? So the question is about cases in school districts. Anyone else besides the Port Heron Area School District? And the answer is yes. We've had some cases show up at Algonac. Um, any other private schools? I can't remember them all, but yeah, they're popping up all over the place. So there isn't a school district that's exempt from this is immune from this or is having more of a problem than others. I will say that so far the cases in the schools are not related to the school itself. They are not becoming infected because they are attending a school. It's not a transmission within the building. All of these cases can very easily and clearly been uh, connected where their source of infection 
quite honestly, most of the time is their families. So that's what we're seeing. If we see cases that are related to each other where it seems like maybe they were infected within a school building, whole different conversation. Um, and we're hoping um, that that's not going to happen. And, and we continue to work, you know, daily and weekly with all the school districts mm -hmm. on those mitigation and, uh, and better ways to deal with this as we continue and as we learn. So, Which is another reason why these things like mask wearing and distancing is so important in the right. schools. Because when you do have a case there, contact tracing and our, our quarantine of those that were exposed. But if you're doing all the right things, even if you're a quarantine, the chances are you're not going to get infected. You're not going to start incubating that virus and becoming positive. And then we were just looking at the data so far regionally, um, only really less than one in five people who've been identified as contacts and have been quarantined actually go on to develop uh, a case, to become a case themselves, to develop the virus. So just because you're exposed doesn't mean you're going to get sick. And the more you pay attention to your own personal safety with masks and distance, even less likely that you're going to actually get sick. Okay, there's a rumor Marysville School District may go back to in-person teaching this mm -hmm. month. What are your thoughts on that? So the question is a rumor about in-person teaching. And I know Marysville was the one school district that held off. Um, I do believe, and I've said this before, I do believe as the, as the community co uh, transmission, if it continues to remain low, that in-person learning is over virtual learning. I think it's to everyone's advantage, both parents and certainly with students, to, to try and get them back in the classrooms. And so I would support that and encourage it. And all I can say is we just need to watch it. Every, every step forward, we have to be willing to take a step backwards as, as we evaluate the situation. But many of our school districts have been in session now three weeks, more, four more. weeks. And I have to say, really, I'm very proud of them. They're, they've done a great job. The communication is, is excellent. And even with the positive cases that have popped up in them, uh, really no disasters so far. So um, I think we are in many ways prepared and I'm willing to move forward with that uh, if that's the decision of the Marysville School District. All right. Able to get any rapid testing devices? You've been working on that for quite a while. I'll, I'll let Justin talk. So about that. we are uh, we are in the process of uh, working through the purchasing system right now for some uh, availability and some ability here at the health department to do point of care testing. Now, that won't be for every single person that wants to get point of care testing. Uh, the department's going to use it so that they can uh, quell outbreaks and things like that. So, uh, and that's really its best use. Uh, antigen testing, which is probably the future of point of care testing, it's close, but it's not here in St. Clair County yet. And we'll be sure to let you know as soon as it does arrive. I ask every day. Yes, she does. Um, uh, the state has uh, is receiving uh, supplies from the and they are in charge of distributing that. So it is not up to us to say we want some. It is their decision whether to distribute it to us or not. And of course, that will be based on risk. And right now, as I mentioned, given the fact that we have 2.6% positivity and less than 10 cases a day, we're probably not going to be on their, their hit list. But uh, we'll, we'll keep trying. Right, and a little more on that. So. Basically how that works is the federal government went in and bought every antigen test uh, that was known to be useful or work. Uh, they purchased all of them. So there's a backlog and an inavailability for the rest of us right now. So we're working through those questions too. In fact, one of the questions that we came in earlier was about um, um, yeah, where can someone get antigen testing? And I believe it's out there because we are getting reports of antigen testing from providers, et cetera. But I can't honestly, if you go on the MDHHS uh, COVID testing site, there are two sites within 50 miles of us that, that um, advertised rapid testing. Now, rapid testing could be antigen or it could also be the rapid molecular testing. And that was in Roseville on 13 Mile and Hoover Urgent Care. There may be others out there. In fact, you guys can help us all out. If you yeah. go and get an antigen test, let us know. Um, it's very helpful for us to know those things. And uh, we only know what people 
formally post or what we learned through the grapevine. So um, that's that'll be helpful to know. All right. My niece has what seems like a cold, stuffy nose, slight cough, sore throat, but no fever. Would you recommend her getting tested? Yes. So the question is, somebody has uh, mild symptoms, but more than one. So one of the criteria is more than one symptom. So if you only have a scratchy throat and nothing else, maybe not. But scratchy throat, cough, stuffy nose, stuffy nose no fever, please get yourself tested. Um, that is the only way to know. As I said before, younger people tend to have much milder disease and oftentimes no symptoms at all. So finding out whether or not that individual has COVID, very helpful to the rest of the people in her family, the older people in her family, the grandparents, etc. That's the only way to know for sure. And there should be enough availability of testing. Again, go to that site where you can get that without a, a great deal of harm. Now, when you go get tested, most of this is not rapid testing, as I just said. So if there's a delay in your results, assume you're positive until your results come back. If you, if you feel like you're going to get tested, uh, keep, keep yourself low. Don't go out. Um, that's not the time to go to a big party and hang out with people. Just wait until your results come back. Okay? And that goes back to the other thing. Remember, if you have been told to quarantine by us, by an official, yes, you are a contact of a known case, and we're asking you to quarantine for 14 days, a negative test does not get you off the hook. Does not, you still have to stay in quarantine. But if you're just doing it because you're curious, doing it because you think there, you have some mild symptoms, wait till the test result comes back, and then if it's negative, carry on. Um, so where are some places that she could get tested? Okay, so on our website, there are two things. There's a list that we try and keep track of, a table of all the places that we try and keep up with the details of what they might need, what the process would look like, and as well as a direct link to the state's website testing, which they also keep up pretty well. You link on that, you put your zip code in, and it'll tell you what's within 10 miles, what's within 25 miles, and what's within 50 miles. All the information you need is right there. So go to that site and look it up. There's a variety of availability. There's even now we know where you can do your own test at home. Right. Uh, that's, on, that's on our list, the LabCorp. And uh, they'll send you a kit. You do your own. You send it back. And you have results back usually within 24 hours. We right. tested that out with our own staff. And, it was pretty quick. So lots of options for testing. You shouldn't have any difficulty finding testing. So what is the county's test positivity percentage? Our, our test positivity percentage is 2.6% as of today. It's remained below 3% now for two months? At least two months. At least two months, if not longer. But the last couple weeks, we, have, we were down below 1% for a little while. And uh, we have seen a very slow, steady increase in that. But we're still below. You know, if we go above 3%, we are a little antsy. If we start getting into 5%, we're going to be looking at probably a lot more cases in the community. So we'll let you know. Every day we're reporting that. And you can find that on our website as well on our dashboard. Why don't you guys um, answer one of your questions? Sure. So one of the big questions on mine that came in earlier was, is it safe to celebrate Halloween this year? And so uh, my answer is, it's safe to do a lot of things as long as you understand the current situation, you take the appropriate measures, uh, and also the CDC and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services both put out uh, additional guidance for Halloween. And, and we have it here. Um, but basically, they're just, we're trying to limit direct contact. So things like don't hand out candy if you're sick. Uh, wear a face mask, obviously. Um, distribute candy on disinfected tables. Wash hands often. That's the biggest two, right? Masks mm -hmm. and washing and hands often. And don't let them all congregate on your right. front porch. So if they're all coming up to your for front porch, do something else. Maybe have axes on the sidewalks where they can stay or or put your candy distributing maybe out at the end of the driveway so that they can keep moving. Because you know how those trick-or-treaters, they all end up coming to your porch all at one time, and then it takes a while to get it all distributed. So right. that's really, yeah, really it. Have fun, but be careful, right? Candy is not the, 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 the risk. It's people close to each other for long periods of time. Right. So. All right. Want to answer one of your questions? Okay, one of my questions. 
So we talked about places that should be avoided, not really. Let's talk about people are dying. When people die, are they truly dying of COVID? That comes up a lot. And my answer is probably. Um, we know that uh, COVID deaths are counted through death certificates. And a death certificate has to be filled out by a licensed healthcare provider, a physician who is has knowledgeable about the case. Um, most people don't die of COVID. They die of pneumonia, as respiratory failure, as caused by pneumonia, as caused by COVID, right? Or they die of a stroke uh, that was made, uh, that was theoretic, you know, that was thought to, to be prompted because of COVID. So co COVID is an underlying, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? It's an underlying uh, condition. Condition, an underlying condition that that made that death uh, happen. Okay, so typically COVID will be listed on the second, even the third line of a death certificate as a contributing cause. So if they didn't have COVID, they wouldn't have gotten the pneumonia, they wouldn't have died. So those are the things we assume. Now there's always judgment involved with that, but we have to trust our healthcare professionals who are actually taking care of these people to know what that is. Right. And generally, you're not gonna put COVID on the death certificate unless you've tested the person for COVID. So they're not just making up, oh, that person had pneumonia, let's call it COVID. I'm not seeing that at all. Tests are being done, and only with positive tests does that COVID get on the death certificate. So yeah, I think probably most, um, if not all, of those COVID-related deaths are legitimate. All right. Um, are, both, are bars supposed to still be closed? So many seem to be open. Bars are supposed to be closed unless, or they're supposed to be closed if more than 70% of their revenue is generated from liquor. Is that right? Okay. Yes. There's so many. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But they're getting away with it because there's things like Kino and other revenue generating things that they can say, oh, this is really how we make our money. And you can't really fight that and so what we do is we feel like a, a, a bar is is not open we'll report it to the Myosha to Laura but in general they're getting away with this because there's lots of ways to make your books look like how you generate your revenue and that's I think that's the simplest way to say it there's there's um there's uh things that they can get around it So another question I have is, what current emergencies or projects is the Emergency Operations Center handling at this time? Well, obviously we're dealing with COVID. We're also dealing with an ongoing flooding and erosion issue. As we switch from uh, summer into fall and then winter, uh, many of you may know that Lake Huron gets really rough and gets ugly. Because the water level is so high right now, we're experiencing quite a bit of erosion on, on Lake Huron, uh, all the lakeshore. So, uh, so we're dealing with that. We're also uh, working on our normal projects. So uh, we're having to catch up on the last six months worth of work where we basically devoted most of our time to COVID. So that's what we've got going on right now. Always there. Always. In the background. Um, you have a question? No. I'll do one. Um, the, uh, one of the questions was, I saw that the University of Arizona used wastewater to identify cases of COVID in the dorms and we're able to detect immediately a bunch of asymptomatic people. This is true, this really did happen. There was, um, there's actually a number of, of projects going on, uh, including in Michigan, where they're evaluating uh, how to screen wastewater for the COVID antigen to help first locate an area and then zone in on that area and then do the testing of those people. Uh, Macomb County, I believe, had some grants to do it. I have not seen the results, and I don't know if they're actively applying it, but I do know that we've been um, approached by the state as well to be part of that, and of course we would be. I think it's fascinating. And every way we can do this to be a little bit more scientific and a little bit more streamlined is going to be a win. So it is an emerging process, um, theoretical, but I believe it's it's valid. I think it's something that it's a tool that we're going to be able to use in the future. And interestingly, 37 different states and four countries are currently uh, involved in those sorts of projects. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's what we know of. There could be many other countries that are involved that we don't know of. So, uh, it is a, a, an emerging technology, as Doc said, 
and uh, we're getting better at understanding those mm -hmm. results every day. You always have to understand the limitations of these things so that you don't interpret the information incorrectly. And that's what's, wrong, that's what's difficult with new technology or new approaches like this, is you really have to understand what parts of it you can trust and which parts of it will send you down that primrose trail and you know, test a bunch of people you didn't need to. So I think that's the information we really need first before we can operationalize it in a community like ours. But it's, right. it's, I think it's coming, okay? One of my other questions is, uh, with fire prevention week month approaching, how often should you change your battery and your smoke detector? And there's a really easy answer for that. So every time we move the clocks either forward or back, uh, that's when you should go ahead and put that new uh, smoke detectors. And if you have a whole, ho a whole house system, go ahead and check every, uh, every, de every detector in the house to make sure it's operating properly. I have one left. Uh, where my grandson goes to school, Parents need to take their children's temperature and answer questions daily before the child can attend school that day. Is that the case in St. Clair County? It should be. What we've asked all of the schools to do is have their parents do daily screeners. Now, I don't know that they need to submit that information to the school. Um, again, if things get out of control and really difficult to manage, that may be another of stricter control that we could do but right now parents are just being asked to do that daily with their kids um, ask that list of questions and then make sure that the kid doesn't have a fever and we prefer them to do that before the kid even leaves the house because um, they will be identified later and then once the kid is identified uh, you're gonna have to come and pick them up and take them home so mm -hmm. yeah all right you mentioned that there are new treatments and medication being used for COVID can you elaborate on that well, there's not a lot of new things. Uh, Remsidivir has been uh, a hopeful product and our hospitals do have access to that. It's being used primarily, actually only in hospitalized patients and it's an IV drug. Of course, hydroxyquinolone or hydroxychloroquine um, has been somewhat of a disappointment. The data is still out there. There are still clinical trials going on to see if it's useful, but most of our providers are not using it. It has been advised not to use it unless you're in a clinical trial because there are pretty significant side effects of, of cardiac arrhythmias um, such as that. Um, we have plasma uh, treatment. We're not really sure how great that is. We have a vaccine. We're not really sure when that's going to happen. One of the things the hospitals are doing better, though, is knowing how to just treat COVID patients for their acute illness as far as um, oxygenation, not intubating as quickly, um, putting them on anticoagulants quicker so that they don't have strokes and heart attacks. And those are the kinds of measures I believe are really making the difference. It's not that we've got these great drugs. It's that we've just learned to manage Co really sick COVID patients better. We know it works better. And those are being implemented across the board as well. All right, last question. Do you think the COVID cases by the end of the year will exceed flu cases seen last year within the same time frame? We already have. Yeah. <laughs> we already have a lot more COVID cases than we ever had flu in a season. Um, flu is only reportable if you die of the flu. In fact, if you're a pediatric death, it's quite honestly, is the only reportable. Thing. So um, keeping track of flu cases is problematic. And if you've ever looked at the CD site about uh, what, what they estimate the flu burden is, there's a pretty wide range. But if you look, the upper end of that estimation is way, way less than what we've had in COVID, even, you know, even a season versus what we've had in six months. So to answer your question, honestly, I think uh, the burden of COVID is going to far exceed influenza. I think the problem with influenza, if we're dealing with an influenza season at the same time as COVID, is we have to very quickly try and figure out which is which because there is treatment for influenza. There's a good vaccine and there are treatments available if you get to it early. And so that need to kind of evaluate and diagnose it correctly is going to even have more urgency. Not to mention that we always see more hospital activity during influenza season. A lot more people get sick and go in the hospital because of the flu. And if you have that burden and then you have an increased burden as well from COVID hospitalizations, it's a double whammy. We always expe expect to see more hospitalizations from flu in, this, in, in the winter months. We always do. All right, closing comments. 
You go first. Sure. So again, every week we like to remind everybody about the uh, community mental health support uh, capabilities. And right now the COVID support line can be reached every day from 8.30 to 4.30 uh, at 810-985-8900. Or you can text them at 810-956-6335. And they're also available via email at COVID19support at sccmh.org. So I wanted to make sure everybody has that information. Uh, obviously our mental health is very important as we transition more towards the colder months, uh, Christmas time, things like that, your mental health uh, becomes mo most important to keep an eye on. So uh, do yourself a favor, take care of yourselves, take care of others, and uh, we'll see you again next week, Doc. Yeah, and COVID fatigue is real, and I've always said that you have to find that balance between ignoring the whole thing and being in a state of panic all the time. You know, we've got to be in the middle where you're cautious, but you live you live your life, right? And so that's where we want to be. And I guess I'm going to say the same thing I always say. I think you guys are doing an absolute job. This community is amazing for all of you guys out there wearing your masks, trying to do the right thing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are making a difference. The reason why we're where we're at right now, our kids are in school, our businesses are going, it's because of all of you guys doing the work. So thank you. And if you have concerns or questions, we're always here to help. Send them our way. We don't know about it unless you tell us. So thanks again. We'll have see you next day. week.